All right, everybody, welcome in. It is Monday, February 27th. It's 3.30, and uh, we are joined by Coach Marv. He was the defense coordinator of the Virginia Tech Hokies. In his playing career, Coach was a four-time All-SEC linebacker during his playing career at Vanderbilt. He is one of the most decorated players in Commodore's history, not notching 397 career tackles, which is top 10 in school history. Coach, welcome. How are you doing today? Man, thank you for having me. I'm doing great. I appreciate that introduction. Now, where do I find one of those ball caps? <laughs> this is over at Hobie Drive. We'll get we'll get you one sent over to the uh, we'll get you one sent over to the facility for sure. My man, um, you know my address. Uh, we we do we do. Wanted to check in quickly on your uh, trip to Richmond in the Nova area this past weekend, uh, furthering your effort to build those Virginia relationships. How did it go? What were some of the takeaways? Yeah, so I mean, you got to think about this state, right? Richmond is is so rich in talent. Phenomenal football coaches, you know, one of our own and Coach Lauren Johnson, who's had tremendous success. And you think about Nova, we've signed some young men who are extremely talented from that area. Also phenomenal, phenomenal football coaches. So it was important to us to get there uh, in person to the, to the degree that we can and spend some time with them just talking football, talking life, talking development. And it was it was really good. Um, you, just the, the reception that was that was given to us. Um, the the extent of the coaching staff that came out, took time out of their day, out of their weekend on a Friday night, on a Saturday. I mean, it, it, it's it's special. You know, you're not getting that everywhere. In the state of Virginia, it matters. Um, and so we're, we're excited about it. Also kind of going on the the topic of what's going on now, winter workouts, spring ball. We just talked to Fuga on Friday about the winter workouts. And to me, it's probably one of the most underrated components of team building on the calendar that you have. Sure. Um, so I'm curious, what are the biggest areas of focus for you and the team uh, in winter workouts going into spring ball? Mindset and fundamentals. You know, I think that in this time, you know, football is so far away, yet close at the same time, right? You know, all the uh, a bunch of the other sports are in session. So all you get to see is a lot of times and with us, particularly in phase one, you get to the building, it's really dark outside. You go to class, come back, and by the time you leave, it's dark again. And for us as coaches, it's more of the same. We get here, it's pitch black. We leave, it's pitch black. And so what you're doing is you're finding the joy in the work, right? Yeah, that the development and the growth is happening because of the consistency and uh, of effort, for, quite frankly. And so for us, there are areas defensively specifically that we wanted to get better at in terms of our footwork, our eye progressions, um, uh, not, false start, not false stepping at the beginning of plays if we're edge or interior rushers, um, having great arm action as we pursue the football, right? And so those are things that we've looked at, but also you got the component of mindset and just the, the drudgery that it takes to do this phase of football really well. And seeing how guys a year ago, how they responded to this phase versus how they're responding to it now. And so, I mean, it, there's beauty in it. There's beauty in the struggle. I mean, like you were talking about the, the shared adversity, the development that comes from that. I mean, uh, you just to get to see who people really are. The young men are and who they who they're trying to become because one thing we take a lot of pride in is that this phase is challenging. You know, it's it's very challenging, and we we take pride in it being that way, and we take pride in guys being able to break through who they used to be, and who they can become. And speaking of that, the hunger drills, which we've heard a lot about, aside from an opportunity to get in shape, this is where you build a team culture, find mm -hmm. out who responds to adversity, who's really a dog on that roster. Um, from what you have seen and what you've learned from your squad this year, who have you? Who are some guys who have really surprised you or raised rise into that challenge? I wouldn't say uh, I've been surprised by by anyone. Uh, I would say a welcome a welcome addition has certainly been Derek Canteen. You talk about somebody with the right mindset, maturity, um, who attacks each day, um, looking to get better, looking to be the best version of who he is and who he who he wants to become. I mean, that kid has worked, come in, that young man has come in and worked day in and day out tirelessly. And I think he's, he's had immediate respect from his teammates because of how he operates. You think you look at some of the older guys, you know, up front with uh, with Mario, with Norrell. Um, you see two interior guys who've seen a lot of football who are approaching this offseason um, with the intent to be better. You know, you look at the second level and third level, look at Nasir Peoples, Alan Tisdale, uh, Kelly Lawson, young men who are working to be the best versions of themselves. Jalen Strowman. I mean, it's you can go on and on and on about things that we've seen. Um, it's about doing it every single day, doing it consistently, and doing it in a way that um, 
that commands respect, frankly. And I, I've been I've been pleased with where we are so far. You know, we hadn't played football yet. We've done a, done a lot of things that are, are related to, uh, you know, putting all 11 together in terms of uh, just different aspects of what we've asked the guys to do. But like you said, man, this this is a, a part of the the offseason regiment that is designed to be challenging, that is designed to call up and out of them what's inside of them. And so, man, it's been fun. And then transitioning a little bit into coaching, Coach Pry, you played for him at Vanderbilt, yeah. reunited with him in Blacksburg. Can you talk a little bit about the impact he's had on you, both as a player, a person, and now a coach? Yeah, I would say as a player, I mean, he had a significant impact on me. You know, I'm somebody who, by the time Coach Pry had gotten to me, I had two to three position coaches. And here's a man I got to spend with 11 months, 12 months of my life with, and he made an indelible mark on who I am as a person. And frankly, he's a big part of the reason why I'm coaching now. You know, once I made the determination to to get into the profession, he's one of the first people I reached out to. And I mean, you talk about the type of man that he is. He's in the middle of, if I remember correctly, it was a rivalry, rivalry week um, against Tennessee. I think I texted him on a Sunday night. And in the middle of game planning that week, I just texted him. I said, Coach, I just want to talk to you, being here about something. He made time in the middle of a game week uh, to meet with me. I think it was on campus. We had an hour and a half, two hour conversation. And I knew then and there when I left that office that uh, I, I wanted to coach. I mean, when I wasn't playing for him, for him anymore and I was living in Nashville, he, his wife, and he would invite me over for meals that he would have with the, with the guys or just with his family. I mean, he just always looked out, went above and beyond, and he, he never had to. And so you, you talk about somebody who not only practiced what they preached, but did it, did it even after the fact of me playing for him. And I had nothing to do with football at the time. So – you know, I knew that once I got in, I wanted to be somebody like that, right? Not just to have a transactional relationship with my players, but to have an authentic and transformative one um, so that I could, you know, make the world a better place just by helping them become the best men that they could be. So then last year, you and Coach Pry kind of co-managed the defense, and we'll get into that in a second, but I want to ask you specifically about Liberty Week. Uh, we've spoken to a few guys about that and how it was, even though, the players didn't necessarily knew the know the news. The only guy who said he kind of knew something was going on during the game was Dax, and he said there were a couple calls that were a little that were a little bit different from what I typically <laughs> see from Coach Pry. Um, so just kind of walk me through that week. Was that something that was planned? Walk me through that experience. Yeah, man. I mean, everything we do defensively since we arrived has been collaborative effort. So it ain't it ain't just about me. It ain't just about Coach. It's about all of us. I mean, you're talking J.C. Price, Derek Jones, Chris and Prelo. Sean Quinn, right? So everything that we've that we've assembled and put together and deployed has been reflective of who our defensive unit is, who's on the field at the time, and what we feel like we can get done. So obviously going into that week, we didn't know that it was going to be our last week, um, our, our last game of the season. Um, but we just went into it with the mindset of, hey, let's go get this one. Let's go get – we've been so close. We've been in a position to finish. But defensively, let's do absolutely everything that we can to get this done. And obviously, right, you go in to every week with that kind of mindset. Um, just that week, man, I, we were able to hit it on all cylinders. And the guys went out and executed, and they they went out and got it done. So it was fun to watch. You know, you talk about – I've gotten a lot of questions about that week, right? But the, the biggest thing that I remember is the smiles, all the smiles that I saw on the players' faces, right, for them to see the the fruits of their labor because they've worked they worked tirelessly all year to just to not be able to finish and to finally be able to get that done in the fourth quarter where you had to close out a game. I mean, that, that was special to me. Something I, I won't forget. Uh, I've said it a thousand times. Uh, we traveled down for the Liberty game and one, the testament to the coaching and the players and everything else was no quitting the team at all. And for them yeah. to have that jubilation at the end of that game, get that yeah. done uh, was truly something special. Thanks, man. Um, I want to train last one I have before a couple of rapid fire questions for you. Uh, Coach Foster, um, back when I was at Tech and still the lunch pail mentality, had a very specific type of build and player that he looked for in recruiting. And I know that some of it is you, you have hearkened back on that mentality. But I want to know when you are going out on the road and you're recruiting, what qualities are you looking for in players that you recruit to be a part of this defense and this team overall? Yeah, it certainly has to be somebody first and foremost who fits who we are and who we want to become, right? So maturity is something we certainly look for. Somebody who is a tireless worker, somebody who's willing to sacrifice um, to get to where they want to go. Um, because again, everybody gets to see what goes on on Saturdays or Thursday nights, 
but they don't see the the 4 30 a.m wake ups right or the late night where, they, where the kids are studying and trying to get done what they need to get done so they, they can play i mean it you look for people who are willing to do that. You look for athleticism, certainly. You look for speed. You look for those tangibles, that the length that and the girth that everybody wants. But also it's the intangibles, too, right? The um, intellect to the degree that you need to have per position and per what we ask kids to do. Um, the buy-in, how who they are as a teammate, and also who, who they are individually, both on and off the football field. Um, because you can be the most talented person in the country. But if you're not if you're not good for the program, if you're not good for the locker room, you won't be good for us. Um, conversely, you may not be uh, the most heralded prospect, but you have intangibles. You have a skill set that fits what we need and what we're looking for. And you may just you may just be exactly what we need and the, the perfect fit for us. So I think it's a combination of all of those things and about being transparent in terms of what you're looking for and what, what's needed um, in order to get it done. And last year, this is our last segment. It's the rapid fire segment. The first one's probably the most difficult one, uh, but my favorite one to ask. If you could have dinner with four people, dead mm. or alive, where are you going and who are you having to dinner? Mm. Number one, I'm having I'm having dinner with Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory for anybody that's a believer that's watching on here. Um, secondly, I would probably have dinner with my um, my great-grandfather. Um, he he is a Navy veteran, fought in World War II, um, just a, an entrepreneur, um, born and raised in Mississippi and developed a family in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and uh, just instilled a lot into our family. I just never got to spend a ton of time with him as an adult, right? Um, he was just this old, really disciplined, really, uh, really uh, driven man that I got to see as a child, uh, but never really got to... Uh, ask the questions that you like to ask in the phase of manhood, right? So he would be somebody. Um, the other two, James Baldwin is, okay. is an author and poet that I really admire. Um, read a ton of his work. Somebody who's unabashedly unapologetic about who he is and what he believes, um, which I have a ton of respect for. And the fourth person, you stumped me on that one. I would, I would say those three for sure. Okay. That was the, qu that was the quickest and uh, that felt like you had it, uh, had it figured out. Do you know where you'd go to eat? Where I'd go to eat? Yes. Where are you going to mm. go? I would certainly go to a steakhouse. Uh -huh. If we're in the New River Valley, we're going to Frankie Rollins. Okay. No question. Okay. Any pregame routines, superstitions, uh, anything that you have to do every single game before you get, in the, uh, get out there? You know, I don't have – I'm not – big on superstitions. Uh, I'm always going to talk to my wife before a game, whether it's the first thing in the morning, uh, FaceTime with my daughters if I can. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I pray and ask for guidance and discernment and make sure that I can be the best who I am. i be the best person myself for the players. Um, other than that, brother, we're rolling. Because the work is the work has been done. Now it's about it's time for execution. Last two that I have for you. Uh, who is a player last year that you learned from since your arrival in Blacksburg? Mm. Well, well, I learned a, I learned a good bit from a number of the players. Um, what what I would say is, Chamari jumps out and Dax jumps out, right? So, uh, when it comes to Chamari, just somebody who is when you see somebody who is totally invested to the cause and not themselves, and you see the the celebration from the work that he's able to do on a consistent basis. It just reminds you as a coach, like that is what we need. That is the type of young man that allows programs to, to grow and flourish. Uh, I would say the same for Dax. I mean, you talk about a six year guy who was, who was also starting on punt, who did a lot of different things that he hadn't necessarily been asked to do, but did it because that's what we needed from him last season. And so, man, I, I'm just always amazed that, and that's what I love about this game. Um, when you find special players, special young men who are also who have the capacity to be selfless for their brothers and for their teammates. I mean, it, it is special to watch because you don't necessarily see that in our society in other aspects. Right. But if you can see it within the confines of a football team or any sport, team sport, when it's special, it's noticeable. So those two for sure. Last one I have for you. As you continue to build this program, as you continue to build this defense. 
when you have somebody that tunes into Virginia Tech and watches that defense play, when they step away from that game, regardless of what the score is, regardless of anything else, what do you strive to leave an impact on the person watching or the team that you're playing? A unit that plays together collectively with great speed, running by the ball, being disruptive, playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage, playing with great physicality and having great situational awareness and doing what's needed to be done in order to uh, do our part to play complimentary football and win football games. That's what I want us to see. I want to see uh, – that's what I want everybody to see, a, a unit that loves one another, that it doesn't matter what 11 are on the field. Th those 11 are the starters at that moment in time. And I think when you see that, it's identifiable, and I think it's very distinct. And so that's what we're working towards, my friend. Coach, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate you taking the time. I know you got a busy schedule. We'll get this hat out to you, and I appreciate the time. Best of luck this spring and into the season. My man, thank you. Have thank a good you. night.